What's up, guys? Welcome to the first ever episode 159 of the Kind of Funny Games cast. As always, I'm Tim Geddes, joined by the Reverend Jared Penny. I'm glad to be here. Oh, thank you. Thank for you the, so much. For the first time, officially uh, in... At the chair, yeah, kind of here, games here, cast. this is the beginning. I and right now, oddly, I'm the third chair, and yet today it's I'm just the a second one on chair. One. And now I guess this isn't your first time on the show. You've been on Games Cast before, but this is your first time as a permanent yeah, host, as a as a regular, as a host, as, as a part of the kind of funny family brought into the fold, adopted by these three fathers and various sisters and brothers mm -hmm. at all, etc. Brought into the midst of you, I like Oliver Twist. Now among you, part of the family, like little orphan Annie. One of the coolest dudes in video games. Glad to be here. Oh, right you're so sweet, sweet. The Reverend, Jared Petty. I want to try to make that Doki Doki thing a thing. I like thing. the Doki Doki. Doki Doki. There All right, go. there we go. We're That's going for that. Catchphrase. That's all right. I don't have a catchphrase yet. What? What does Doki Doki mean? Yeah. That's the sound of your heart. It's uh, automatopoeia for like pitter patter. Like the sound your heart makes when you're excited or scared or in love. It's a very kawaii thing. Exactly. You know what I mean? It's like pon pon, which is a popping bubble. Or, you know, there's a lot of choo choo. That's the sound a, sound a mouse makes. Or, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, Pika. Exactly. Pika chew. There you go. Pika, that's, exactly. That's, that's, Pika that's, Pika. A lot of things making sense here. Uh, shout out to Patreon producer Tom Bach for keeping the show going, making it run. Now, I also wanted to give a shout out uh, to Nick Scarpino and Andy Cortez for doing the beautiful artwork that uh, the people watching live right now uh, did not get to see. But the the going forward on YouTube and on everything, there's the, the new games cast intro that features Jared Petty as Mario and as Chun Li. Oh, have you even seen this? I haven't yet? seen this yet. Oh man, I have not I, I need, seen I need this. To show you it is it is fantastic uh oh, really? somewhere but i mean you know no, don't I'm, see it um i don't know nick maybe uh but yeah so that shout out to them for making the intro it was really cool oh i'm really excited yeah, it's, I, it's i'm vain one. i want it's, to see myself excellent you're also uh one of the slimes from uh <gasps> dragon you made me Warrior. a drag slime i did oh, well i didn't <laughs> i didn't if i'm being honest i didn't do anything i just told people to do things and they did and i was like wow that was really good welcome to executive level oh man exactly look there at you me c-suites you know exactly. what i'm talking about do you like the dragon quest do you uh, like the slime? never gave him a shot okay so you, you like the dragon ball i'm right? a fun no no no, no. Not a dragon well, it's ball. not that I don't like it. I just I didn't have Cartoon Network growing up. Okay. So never Dragon Ball Z, not my thing. Get okay. it? I'm sure I would have loved it. If fucking little Tim Gettys got his hands on Dragon Ball Z when he was little, <laughs> he would have been addicted. Uh, but no, I, I I missed out on that whole boat. And I was a Final Fantasy guy, but that was later in yeah. the game. Okay. Uh, but in the pre-show, me and you were talking about uh, Pokemon a lot. Yeah. And Pokemon was my you know my first kind of entry into the world of role playing games. No and kidding. That was your first RPG. Yeah, I feel like I feel like there's a lot of people uh, from my generation. It makes sense. That 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 was kind of their their first time where it's like, you know what, reading is fun. I'm gonna I'm gonna do that. And it's not gonna be the worst thing ever. Pokemon easily if you're making and making the top twenty five most important video games ever. Absolutely red and blue, easily on that totally. list. Influenced a generation and influenced a lot of design to follow. Mm -hmm. And the way that we thought about what video games could be, it it really did. It changed the way we approach franchising. Mm -hmm. around games uh which, trading card games exactly and, uh, tv shows i mean movies well, and yeah in america pokemon was a game that came out about a tv show yeah pretty you much know, i mean but, that, I, I remember uh the nintendo power issue where yeah. i first fell in love with the idea of yeah. these pocket monsters exactly um and there, or a tv it, it show about a game i'm doing it backwards here it, it came is. it came with a comic book uh that was a uh adaptation of the first episode of pokemon yeah. i was like well i huh oh what yeah, and I couldn't wait to see that. And then uh, I, I was reading more about it. And I was like, oh, these games have already been out in Japan. It's like it was this yeah. whole mythos to it. And then, of course, it, it turned into what it was. But uh, you can hear more about that in the pre show. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Kind of Funny Games cast each and every week right here on youtube.com slash kind of funny games. We get together to talk about video games and all the things that we love about them. You can get the show. Uh, every Friday early by going to patreon.com slash kind of funny games at 9 a.m. Or you can get it later uh, the following Monday on youtube.com slash kind of funny games uh, or podcast services around the globe, including Apple Podcasts, Beyond Pod, Stitcher, uh, TuneIn, pretty much anywhere you're listening to to podcasts, you'll be able to find us. Winamp? Uh, Win Winamp, you would have to manually download it and then play it in Winamp. Uh, but uh, it's not your your daddy's llama. Or so if you want to kiss the tukus uh, or kick the tukus of the llama, mm -hmm. that's what it to, was. What? No, it's it was. What was would, the llama phrase? Oh no, no, it was Winamp colon. It really kicks the llama's ass. That's what it was. That was that that's was what, what it was. Said. Yeah. Uh, and if you want to kick the llama's ass, you can you can do that by listening to the, the show and podcast form. We appreciate that very mm -hmm. much. Um, or you can watch the show live for just one dollar 
on patreon.com slash kind of funny games, which also gets you access to uh, the PlayStation VR show, uh, Greg Miller's new show, uh, a week early, every week for the next eight weeks. So I'd call that, that a dollar well spent. Oh, it's definitely worth the dollar. And this episode of the Gamescast is going to be worth the dollar because just like we did with Brian Altano a couple weeks ago, <gasps> we're doing the special one-on-one -on -one going through the gaming history of Jared Petty. And what an act to follow. That is a great episode. Thank I'll, you. I'll, Thank I'll, you. You were fantastic on an Altano. What a dude to follow. And his story so passionate. And Brian Altano is funny. I am not funny, so I'm terrified. Brian Altano so is so funny yes. and I feel like to see him grow in his comedy over the years like he is at peak Altano right now yeah, and I'm is. loving it and I will say thank you for the, the kind words about that episode I totally agree it is that podcast is probably on my it's in my top three for sure if not my top number one mm -hmm. favorite podcast I've ever been on it it's was a such a fantastic show and but then last week we had Huber on from Easy Allies and that was a great episode that was, we're that, on a roll right now ladies and gentlemen that was two hours of you guys snorting cocaine and talking about video games and it, I couldn't have been happier it was great it was just like let's just rain down pure unadulterated love just and hype. it was like a 3 a.m. surge fueled, like like sitting in a dorm oh room God. session, so much talking surge. about about all the things you love. Yeah, I, I was it, a big fan it, of it was it was so fun. I love that so much. But now let's let's make some new memories. Here, now Jared. you're stuck with me. That's oh, right. It's gonna all be, right, it's gonna be go. fantastic. So yeah, let's start this off right with your first real inauguration into the kind of funny games cast world. Okay, let's start from the beginning, Jared. Where, uh, what was your first video game that you ever played? The first video game I remember playing is probably not the first video game I played, but it's a, it's a very clear memory. And it's one of those memories from very early childhood. Uh, I am older than many of the guests you've had on here before. And I was actually born at the end of the 1970s. Because of that, I was delightfully positioned to experience as a small child the arc of arcade wonder at its absolute peak. And I think because I was little, very little, it was even more impressive. An arcade was like this gigantic world. There used to be arcades everywhere. And they, they were these massive machines that were many times my size with what seemed to me huge screens and controllers I couldn't reach at the beginning, towering over me with a cacophony of attract mode noise. And then from somewhere overhead, whatever Michael Jackson had recorded the week before, playing through some tinny speakers. <laughs> what a time. While in the back of the arcade were invariably some some gigantic teenagers that may have been as, as old as 15, playing pool and smoking Man. cigarettes. Oh, and so cool. And the ticket machines out front. And yeah, they were so cool. And to me, that was the best thing I could imagine. And so my, my first memory is uh, going up to a Pac-Man machine. Uh, Pac-Man released in 1980. This memory is probably happening in 81, maybe 82, and I'm like two or three years old. And I walk up to it, and I can see that blue glow of the maze against the black playfield. And I'm reaching up for it, and my father puts his hands on my sides and picks me up, and he puts his arm around me. And I reach out and I touch the joystick with my hand and I hear he's got one arm around me and then I hear the coin click in the slot and that, you know, that starts, we start an arcade game and I guess he pressed the button and he puts both his hands back on me, holding me up there because I couldn't reach the controls. And there's a little yellow, little yellow guy and so bright and so shy. And he starts moving and eating the dots. Walk and walk I walk come walk to walk understand walk very quickly that wherever I move the knob, he goes. I can make him move. And a ghost catches me in like 10 seconds. And I'm, and I'm like, oh, they're bad. I mean, they were colorful, big eyes. I thought they might be my friends, but they're bad. And so I start eating the dots and I start running away from the ghosts. And they're chasing me around. And I'm like, oh, 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 oh. And, I go to fight, and of course, I'm running right into them. And the entire game, you know, but I get over to one of the dots and they change color. And I don't quite know what it means, but they're running away now. And I don't doubt I even caught one. And then, you know, one minute later, my game's over. But I had touched that machine and there's a world on the other side of it. It's kind of like what would happen in my imagination as a kid when I'd imagine I was Luke Skywalker with a lightsaber running around fighting Darth Vader, except it was right there. And I could just like I did in my mind, I could control it, but I wasn't in complete control. It was challenging me and it was just as real as the place I was standing. My life has never been the same since that moment. Ever. I was ruined. By that Christmas, I guess the Christmas of uh, when I was three years old, there was an Atari 2600 in the house. Oh, my God. I mean, I three was three years not, old. Yeah, That's three like, years old. 
Three years old. Very so, young. Exactly. And, I, and the one that I got, delightfully, uh, you know, it comes, it comes with certain games. I had what was called the Sears Video Arcade, which is the 2600 that was sold through the Sears Sporting Goods section. Interesting. Yeah, a little weird. Um, but it's exactly the same machine. Looks the same, just has different letters on it. Uh, plays the same cartridges. It's it's made by Atari. They just had a, a light. Because Atari and Sears, Atari, when they started out, was just an arcade game manufacturer. Couldn't afford to release a consumer product. And so when they released Pong, Sears was their partner. And that, and they that relationship really went on for a while into the 2600 era. Hmm. Um, so Sears would release those, and I had Air Sea Battle, which is also called Target Fun. And then very early on, we got that Pac Man port for the 2600. That terrible, terrible Pac Man port that is nothing like playing real Pac Man. Although t people pick on Todd Fry about this, but that game's actually a stunning technical achievement when you figure out what the 2600 was built to do. Mm -hmm. It's actually kind of amazing. And yes, much later, the Miss Pac-Man that came out was way better, but they also gave the person who made that twice the ROM space. Again, I'm ranting here. So the, how much of this should I'm I do a, in this place? I'm sure people are, are in it. This All is right. fascinating. Fun thing about old video games on the Atari, and this is almost unthinkable, but when, the first several years of Atari 2600 developed from 1977 through the early 80s. If you wanted to make an Atari 2600 game, it had to fit into a 4K ROM. Not RAM. Four kilobytes. ROM. Four kilobytes. To give you an idea what that is, that's the source code for the entire game. You ever seen code for a game? Source code for the whole game. Everything was going to happen. All the graphics had to fit onto one typewritten sheet of paper. That's about what 4K is. So print out a typewritten sheet of just digits, and that's the size that he had to fit Pac-Man into to make the entire video game, um, written in assembly language. So all those old games you play from that era on the Atari, that's what they had to do. Eventually, they were thrilled because they figured out a trick that would let them use 8K oh, and man. get two pages. Double the fun. And that's when you start seeing the games that are you know way more advanced looking. And you're like, so wow, is that where like, Pitfall comes into play? That's Pitfall, I think think is an 8k game it pitfall might be for david crane such a master programmer that pitfall might be might actually be 4k but i think it's 8k david crane who's just a fascinating dude an amazing guy and uh, a great poker player too um he, he took a lot of my money one night uh but crane was so good at reusing is things he the founder of activision or am I he's one of the co-founders okay he's one of the co-founders there's a group of guys at atari that were like hey we're making the games that sell best maybe we should get a bonus and atari's like no and so they're like well we'll just leave and Atari's like fine well atari just never considered that they just go off and they all knew how to make great games and they invented they literally invented third-party console games wow that's interesting to think about. Yeah, they walked out the door, and Atari's like, "Well, fine, just go." They treated them like you know factory workers. That was the the not that there's anything wrong with factory workers, but their argument was, "You're no important to the this business than anyone else." And they're like, "But we make the art. Shouldn't we get a little of the a cut of this? A little more than we're making?" So was Activision the first third party? And Activision was the first console third party, at least the first one to succeed that we remember today. Uh -huh. They walked out, and Atari just hadn't considered. They walk across the street, they get a little seed money, and suddenly you have the four of the very best console video game makers in the world making products for your console, which for the last several, and that happened, it was several years into the 2600's life, because it had a long lifespan. Suddenly, there are people making games for your machine, but you thought you were the only person that was ever going to be able to make games for your machine, because that's how people thought about video games, because nobody had ever tried to do it otherwise. There were third parties on Computers early, like Apple, for example, mm -hmm. they they thrived on third parties. That's what you know, the Apple was a tool, and and it's it's basic system written by Steve Wozniak and the Disc Two. Those were tools. They were pretty much like platforms, almost like iPhone or the iTunes Store today is a platform for other people's creation. Mm -hmm. Apple was kind of the Apple II was kind of that, hmm. along with the Tandy Trash 80, which never gets enough credit for being just as important a computer as that the Apple II. Like some Star Wars, yeah, yeah the TRS 80, an amazingly important computer manufactured by Radio Shack. Apple was the high end. The Trash 80 was the computer for the people that didn't have the money Trash for the Apple 80. Yeah, the TRS 80, uh, the Tandy TRS 80, which okay. everybody called the Trash 80 because it really didn't work all that well. But you could buy a home computer with a monitor for six hundred dollars in 1977. Hmm. At a time that buying an Apple was going to cost you more than twice that. Yeah. And so people were like, well, I can afford that. Gateway. Very yeah. important. Very, very important computer uh, early, is for like 77 to 82, 83 or so. Really important. And a lot of innovation happened there. Also, the Commodore pet for a whole other reasons. But that's a long rant, too. Um, so the Commodore 
64. That's years later. Yeah. That was years. So, okay. So there's a Commodore before the 64. There is. There's a Commodore PET, the PET. Um, 1977, one of the most important years in the history of geekery. You get the Commodore PET, which was very important to the formation of personal computers because it was an all-in-one kit. You had the monitor there. You had this fold-open computer. You had the tape drive. and then, Or you used to put the monitor on top. It opened up. It was easy to work on. They used cassette tapes for programs then. So the tape drive's built right in. It's just like plug and play. Here we go. That was a really neat innovation. Trash 80, accessible, expandable, affordable, a hobbyist computer. You can tinker around with it. People figured out how to make it do sound. It didn't have a sound port, but it wasn't very well shielded from electromagnetics. So early programmers were like, well, if I put my radio next to it and I tune to this station and I send these electrical impulses through the computer, I can make music and sound effects for my game through that radio. What? And people did that. Yeah. Oh, and ma- early computing is amazing. And then Apple, likewise, all the same year, plus that year. So you 77, you get all three of those computers, the Atari 2600, Star Wars, and Dungeons and Dragons goes oh mainstream. God. What a year. Yeah, we talked about this on IGN History of Awesome yeah. some. But the t- most important home console of the first generation of, or that of the first real ROM programmable generation, the three founders, uh, founding uh, uh, examples of personal computing, Dungeons and Dragons and Star, Star Wars. Wars. <laughs> what a year to be alive. Yeah. Now, I wasn't there. Two years later, I'm 79. I come okay. along. So I, I was an early issue 79 and uh, came along. <laughs> yeah, I came way early in that year. So I love to rant about this and I hope I'm not boring people to death. I love this. People innovated. I talked about, I, I've told, shared this story before. Howard Scott Warshaw, um, who's this amazing developer, a really nice guy too. And uh, he's one of the most fascinating people in early, uh, early software development because Howard, by his own admission, um, made some of the best video games ever and some of the worst video games ever. Hmm. He made Yars Revenge, one of the greatest home titles in the history of Atari. Did he make E.T.? He made E.T. Oh, my God. Also. The plot and, and oh, he's, It's great. Like, he made both these. He's like, I have the greatest range yeah, of any developer that. ever. Um, <laughs> and he's great about it. The whole thing. E.T. E. was not his fault. That's that's a whole other can of worms. Mm-hmm. Um, but you have this, this incredible invention. I was talking about that 4K ROM, right? So he's trying to fit this amazing game, Yars Revenge. Great video game. So innovative. There's never been a game like it ever since. Uh, there's still nothing like Yars Revenge. And... He's trying, he needs a force field to stream across the middle of the screen, but he's out of code. He's out of his piece of paper. He cannot fit the graphics for a force field in there. And so he writes a two line routine that reads the source code and streams the source code across the stream in a randomized pattern. It, the code looks at itself and throws itself in a moving pattern up and down the screen which creates an effect because of the way it handled code graphics, a kind of like little flashing colors and, and pixels. When you play Yars Revenge, the force field in the center of the screen is the source code for the game streaming across the middle. Wow. You're watching the source code while you play because That's he needed nuts. a force field. That's the kind of tricks people had to use to fit this stuff in. And not that modern programmers aren't incredibly innovative, but the limitations of hardware and the limitations of platforms have been the root of some of the greatest innovation and artistic creation in the medium. There's a wonderful book uh, that you should read about this called Racing the Beam. Uh, that, that's all all about these these examples. Another person who's talked some about this, Chris Kohler's written about this some, I believe. And I actually, the second episode, to plug my own thing for a second of my new series, Hot Blip and a Jump, is all about this. Uh, and about, uh, about how console wars are kind of a farce. There's this big difference between art and marketing. Mm-hmm. And that actually the differences between consoles are the reason we have more great games. Um, I really believe that. And these are just some examples. But yeah, imagine the radio and all that there. You know, And That's again, I will nuts. rant until you stop me, Tim. So, so I'm, watch I'm out. Gonna, I'm going to stop you. I'm going to stop you here to, to kind of to turn this. Uh, speaking of Hot Blip and a Jump, your, yeah. your new show over mm. on YouTube.com slash. Oh, let's let's uh, let's just point it to hotblipjump.com. That's the easiest Hot way to find Hotblipjump.com. Yeah, I'm on. It's on the Kind of Funny or Hot Blip and a Jump YouTube channel as there well. There you go. Yeah. So your first... Um, episode is is kind of your history with Mario and how Mario's always been there for you and I, I love it. It was yeah. a great show. Um, 
in it, you mentioned the, the first Super Mario Brothers game and when that came into your life. What I thought was interesting is you didn't reference it as a Nintendo game. You referenced it as an arcade game. That's right. That's how I experienced so it first. going from Pac-Man, going then you had the Atari, like where, okay, so where's the jump? When I'm when I'm a little kid, I get my, I get my Pac-Man. When I'm three, I get my 2600. I play, to this day, the 2600, this is not going to be a popular opinion because people say it's hard to go back to, but I don't think this is just nostalgia. There are dozens of games that are still fun today on that console they just look weird and so people don't give them the time of day or they play them for five seconds like you do an emulated game and move on to the next yeah you go back there are dozens of good games on that platform and i played a lot of them along with hundreds of terrible games Mm. um when i was five my parents bought me a home computer they got me what was called a coleco adam in that age of early home computers there were winners and losers Uh uh-huh There was a period of time where everybody and their uncle was making a home computer. Coleco was a leather company that had had some success making above ground pools, followed by Pong clones, like single game home consoles, followed by the ColecoVision, which was actually a very capable and well-designed home computer system, followed by a home computer that happened to play ColecoVision games. My parents, instead of choosing a Commodore 64, wisely chose the Coleco Atom, which almost immediately after they purchased it, went defunct, and there was never any software for it. So I had this very capable gaming hardware, and I could occasionally buy like $1 on-clearance ColecoVision cartridges to play on it, and they were fun. But I was like, man, there ain't anything new for this thing, mm. and I knew that. So I go to arcades, and I was like, things seem kind of weird here. I loved games. I just knew I loved games. Donkey Kong, on the other hand, I knew I loved And that was a game that was only proper to play in the arcade because most home versions of Donkey Kong, when you played them, they had two screens. They had three screens, but they didn't have all four screens. And they certainly didn't have that vertical orientation you wanted. And they certainly, certainly didn't have those high resolution graphics, which that sounds ridiculous. But man, (laughs) when you were a kid, that big monkey was big because you'd never seen anything like that before. And it was as I think, again, Chris Kohler pointed out a game with a story, a arcade game with a story, and I just loved it. This little man with a mustache, and he went boom, da, 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 and I knew him then as Jumpman, and then later I learned his name was Mario. I promise this is going somewhere. Donkey Kong turned the world on its ear, and even the famous ColecoVision port of Donkey Kong honestly didn't completely capture everything that went into that game because it didn't have all the levels, and it, it still had to be compromised. So I wanted to play Donkey Kong in the arcade. Oh, I I loved it. I loved it so much. It was a game of the quest. You kind of felt like if you got to the top of that final level, you beat it. Also, side note, Gary Kitchen made an excellent Atari version of Donkey Kong that gets made fun of a lot. That's not his fault either. For more on that, we'll talk later. That guy's (laughs) awesome. And Gary Kitchen's Game Maker and Keystone Capers are fantastic. Anyway, moving back. So, Donkey Kong. My babysitter would roll barrel or roll footballs at me that I pretended were barrels. And I go do-do-do-do and jump over them. And then I'd smash them with my imaginary hammer. So I'm at my birthday party. Now, here's the problem with being a kid. You're not always sure exactly when things are happening. The way I remember this, this is like my oh, sixth okay. birthday. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. But it might have been my seventh. It might have been the January of my seventh birthday. I thought it was the January of my sixth birthday. I'm at Chuck E. Cheese. Oh yeah. By the way, Chuck E. Cheese. Invented by the guy that started Atari. Do you know that? Sir Chuckster? Sir Chuckster, indeed. Himself? No, no that was actually uh, Chuck E. Cheese invented by Nolan Bushnell. That was his second. No one. shit. After he left Atari, he went on. I know that there's been a lot around that discussion Recently, right now, yeah. but this is a historical thing. He started Chuck E. Cheese no with his way. Atari money. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so Chuck E. Cheese. That's, went on. It's very smart when you think about it, like to be like, all right, well, obviously video games are popular. How can we kind of really monetize arcades in and in a, in grow them out in a different way? Exactly. And after he kind of got pushed out by Warner or decided to leave, depending on who you asked, he went and did that. Hmm. So Chuck E. Cheese Pizza Time Theater, for me, a kid that was, it was a religious obsession. Yeah. I, I wrote once in a, in a notebook that I think both Jesus and Mario had kind of equal reign over my life. I became a pastor and a video game writer, and I'm not trying to mock my faith at all. My faith is something I take very seriously. But I'm talking about the arc of my life. They have defined my vocation, my friendships, my social 
thoughts, my political stances, my that those have all been influenced by those two guys. Isn't that weird? Um, I mean, I, I got it. Six or so, uh, six birthday. I am ranting again. I'll try to bring I, it back I, on. No, plus. I love it. This is perfect. This is why we have it here. So I, you know, I'm playing my games, and there's a Star Wars arcade vector game, one of the greatest mm. all time arcade games ever. Oh my gosh, you remember that thing? Oh yeah, of course. You got Obi Wan. The Force will be with you always. Ve- and unless you've experienced vector graphics in the arcade, it's like VR. You can see it, but unless you put the helmet on, you don't know what it is. Uh-huh. Vector graphics for an arcade game are like that. Mm-hmm. Have you played a vector oh, game? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk. Exactly. Played the uh, uh, Star Wars one, yeah. Yeah, it's fantastic. You just got those. It, it's I can't describe it. It looks like nothing else, and it looks rad. Even today, when you play it, you're like, that looks cool. Yeah, I mean, well, it's it looks like the retro 80s aesthetic that you think of now with just the, the grid and those lines and yeah. the, the colors, and that's what but it was. But there's a cut-your-eye sharpness to it that's mm-hmm. almost like HD, it's hard to describe, and a brightness that like almost hurts your eyes. It's amazing that that a that a regular monitor can't quite pull off. So anyway, I'm there playing those, and I walk by, and even Mario Brothers, a game I think is pretty cool. You know, you got Mario and Luigi running around, they're jumping up and hitting turtles from underneath, and it's pretty cool. You play with your friend, and you can screw with them, and I love that. Nintendo comes back around to that with new Super Mario Brothers Wii all those years later. That's great. And there's this video game machine over there. And there are kids crowded around it like nothing I've ever seen. I mean, just just a flock of children around this thing. It was as if that half of the arcade didn't exist. Not the screaming of Dragon's Lair could bring you that way, nor any of the other fantastic things. And so I come walking over, and there is this little man. And I'm like, holy crap, it's Mario. I know that guy. He's from Mario Brothers. He's, He's from Donkey Kong. He's from Donkey Kong Jr. with the whip. What's he doing in this game? But he's running to the right, and it just keeps going. It just keeps going. And he's jumping on turtles. He's stepping on what I thought were mushrooms. Turned out they were chestnuts. And he's jumping over big holes, and he's grabbing mushrooms and and shooting fireballs from flowers. And he goes under, like, he gets to the end of the game, and then he just goes underground. It's like, that's not the end of the game. It's not even World 2. It's World 1, 2. What is that? (laughs) What does that mean? World War. When you first saw Super Mario Brothers, if you hadn't seen anything like it before, it was like something came down from outer space. There had just, yes, I had played Pac Land before this, by the way. I'd played Pac Land at an arcade Sorry. in Akron, Ohio, which is a scroll to the right colorful mm-hmm. game. It's also the not. This level in uh, Smash Bros. Wii U based off of Based Pac-Land. off Pac Land, yeah. Mm-hmm. Pac Land is not fun. Mm-mm. That is a bad game. Very bad. Um, Colors are hideous yeah it's together. often you know it's often uh and it's important because it did it showed how to a lot of times games that do things badly first open the door for great mm-hmm. things but mario there, there never been anything like that mind completely blown again this could go for three hours if you yes let me. i love it so i'm so, sitting well, there playing on, but, it and yeah so i sit down i play i pop my quarter in but i mean so i i have the immediate question your your first experience with super mario brothers was in the arcade in the arcade that's right versus super mario brothers, versus super mario brothers which is recently released on nintendo switch if you want that version which is a game. meaner version of super mario brothers but that didn't matter because i couldn't get past world one one or one two at that point uh-huh. and so it just did not matter just getting the fire flower became a goal for me that night but so time wise when was this? Like, well, was, again, my memory's a little flawed. I think it's eighty six. Okay, but so it might have, but Mario, it might have been January of eighty seven. But Mario had been on, obviously, the NES first, right? Well, you got to remember though. So the NES rolls out in October of nineteen eighty five, in test markets, in New York, maybe L A. You know, it's it's getting out there. In eighty six, it's hit shelves, and there's buzz, but there's not mania. There's no internet at this point. So the way that we learn about new things from our friends is a little different. Whenever this event happened, none of my friends had an NES. None of us were talking about the NES, which is why I think it's 86. Because 86 is really, at that point, the only really good games I can think of on Nintendo by 86 are Super Mario Brothers, Duck Hunt's Okay, Excite Bike, Gradius, Ghost and Goblins is all right. Um, there's not a lot else at that point. Uh, in the United States. That first year was was thin. Kung Fu was okay. Hell yeah. And exactly. Kevin's, uh, Kevin's in on that. And, but I know I play this game. All I do is talk about it. I go to school the next day. We're supposed to write an autobiography with like pictures. 
It's like a project we've been working on for weeks. I scrap it. I stop working on the last chapter, which is about my little brother being born. And I start working on a new chapter, which is about how I played Super Mario Brothers. And I draw the machine and that's all I want to write about. My parents are very unhappy with me. In the way I remember it, like a week later, my friend calls me excitedly on the phone. He's like, you have to come over right now. I run up the street. I'm like, what is this? Down in the basement. And he and like some cousins that I'd never met before there. And one of the cousins had brought an NES. And they're Super Mario Brothers. And this is the first moment that I know that this is something that can happen in your house. Because that didn't happen. It was always a compromise. It was always some little blocky man. It was always fewer levels. But that version's better. It's better. It's more fun. It's better about... And it's like... <gasps> And then my parents did not want to buy me <laughs> a Nintendo Entertainment System. How much was the NES when it first came out? When it very first came out, I think Frank Cifoli is the right guy to ask because there's a little debate about this. But the kits I remember best, av um, the price points ranged eventually between $80 for just a control deck with no game and a controller or two. Uh, about $100 to $120 for the control deck late, earlier on, and then later on to the control deck, plus Mario, plus the gun, plus Duck Hunt, 100 mm -hmm. to 120 And the $150 price point came with Rob, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. This okay. is what I remember. My family had no money. Now, My parents for, bought me this computer, and they're like, are you kidding me? We're like, not buying you a video thing? game. You have Yeah, what is this? For comparison, Atari 2600, how much was that going for? By the time my parents bought it, it was five years old. So at yeah. that point, it was probably going for like 60 bucks. Cool. Okay. And also at the time my parents bought it, they had more money. Same time as when they, around when they bought my computer. But we had moved. My dad was working three jobs to make ends meet. It was really tight. And they also didn't want to support my crazy mania about this. They thought it was passing. So it was a long time. So I was that annoying kid that you knew that just wanted to to come over to your house so I could play with your Nintendo. I made friends with people I didn't like so I could go play their Nintendo. But I was not just a Nintendo guy even then, my friend. I was a connoisseur of all things video games. My parents would try to satiate me. There were t At that period of time, you could buy Atari 2600 and ColecoVision games for a dollar in box out of these giant bins in the front of, of Targets and toy stores and Kmarts. Because they were just, they'd made so many and no one had bought them for so long. So they would buy me these dollar games. They'd buy me but this huge library. And then I'd buy these surplus games for my computer whenever I could, you know, with pocket money or with what my grandparents sent me. Or, and of course, at that point, saving up $120 seemed unimaginable. Oh, yeah. That was more money than anybody ever had. Well, I mean, you're at this point seven? Maybe seven, maybe six. That's and, insane. And so it took a very long time. I would go to the mall with my, you know, my uncle when I'd visit Ohio. He'd take me to the mall and play video games and hand me quarters. He actually had a lot to do with me loving arcade games so much because he'd take me out and he'd take me out on dates with his girlfriend, who's now my aunt. And we'd go out and play video games. And I just, I just long. I'd sit there and think about it. I would stand in stores for hours. I would get every Christmas catalog and circle everything. And year after year, Santa did not bring it. I would obsess over games. I read every magazine I could get my hands on. I would buy the Jeff Roven strategy guide books before I owned the games. I would buy game guides and game maps for games I did not own. I had a friend. I learned about the Sega Master System. I saw it at a demo in this, uh, Montgomery Ward, and I was almost seduced. Montgomery Ward, wow. I was almost seduced because the they, were running, side. they were running Fantasy Star uh -huh. on that sucker. And let me tell you what, you talk about, you see the 3D graphics, because I loved RPGs. I was never locked in one camp because I did love computers. And my mom would sometimes be able to bring an Apple II home from school. And by that point, the Apple II was like 10 years old and still going. And so the 1987 or so, the Apple II is still kind of in its peak and it's a decade old. And so I'm sitting there playing things like Ultima 3 and um, these amazing old games and Choplifter and Oregon Trail and stuff like that. And like Zork and like, these incredible, venerable classics. The Ultimate games made me love RPGs. I was like, Ultima's incredible. Then I met Wizardry. And then I learned Wizardry was on the NES and I went on NES even more because the graphics look better on the Wizardry there. And I was just stymied. And then I watched it like Dragon Warrior is coming and that's a thing. And oh my gosh, it's an RPG on the NES. And I love Ultima and I want to play RPGs and I'm at my friend's house. And, I and finally, they relented. Oh, it's time, motherfucker. 
they relented and the Ennis came into my life. And um, so at this point, what year is it? Gosh. Like, what did the library look like there? Like, did was Mario 3 out? It was kind of. Was Mario, Mario 3 2 out? 2 was out. Mario 3 was not. Because oh, Mario 3 was one of my happiest gaming memories of all. Um, so, Mario, you sure it's all right? I'm going so long. Hey, this is what we want. All right, we're going to do this a long time. Here we go. This I'm an old man. It's going to take a while. All right. So, I get it. The first game, you know, comes to Super Mario Brothers. Duck Hunt at that point. I get the control deck set. Duck Hunt's fine. I'm going to play Mario. I got real good at skeet shoot. Um, and even then, I loved Mario. There were so many other games to play. And my birthday's almost immediately after that. And I really did love, you're just going to laugh at this. There's a, ult, the Ultima games are very important to me. I had played Ultima 3. I knew about Ultima 4 at that point. And those two games, if you hadn't experienced them before, those are the templates on which Dragon Quest, Final Fantasy, pretty much all contemporary RPGs are built. A lot of the stuff that we get and expect from an RPG was born in Wizardry and Ultima and those mm -hmm. series. And when there's nothing else like them out there, they were so as wizard fresh and innovative as any groundbreaking game you've played today. Is Wizardry related to Warriors and Wizards? Wizards no, and Wizards and, and Warriors is a different game. Totally different. That's a, actually Rare made Wizards and Warriors. Um, really? Yeah, yeah that's a side-scrolling mm. platformer by Rare. Rare made, I believe, 60 NES games, mostly for other publishers. Yep, uh, Rare made a, they hacked effectively the NES and were like, hey, Nintendo, look what we can do. We made games. And Nintendo's like, cool, want a license? And that was how that started. Huh. Uh, and uh, uh, at least that's the story as I've heard. I think that was again from Frank Cifaldi. And Solemn, I think, was the first one. And they went on to make like 60 games for the thing. It's unreal. No, Wizardry was a dungeon crawler, 3D dungeon crawler. Ultima was the top down RPG. Mm hmm. And Ultima also had some dungeon crawling sections. When you put the two together, you got these party-based games about story. And then Ultima 4, good lord, Ultima 4, which is about ethics. It's about, there's no, it, that game, modern video game storytelling, everything that surprises us, everything innovative, everything that gets to the feels a little starts largely in Ultima 4. Wow. Where it's about, there is no big bad. You, you're looking for one, you're expecting one, and you discover the entire quest. And this sounds pretentious now, but again, in 1985, this is unreal. No, you're trying to overcome yourself. Hmm. This is about trying to become a better person. It's about trying to take a dark world and inspire it and become a better human being. And that's the, it's an RPG built around that, like a party. It's really strange and beautiful. So Ultima and uh, Wizardry affected the games I love very much. I also love war games and battle games. I like strategy games, I liked board games. A lot of those were on PC. Well, a lot of those made their way to NES as well. Not as many made this. Famicom didn't wars didn't make it to the to the US. Yeah, or but, Fire Emblem. Or Fire Emblem. But clones or knockoffs like uh like Kekmo's Desert Commander or Shingen the Ruler did make it over. And I played those games all the time. Or Nob Nobunaga's Nob Ambition, Ambition, yeah. Uh, which again was a game I really loved as a kid. I was a weird kid. And um so I made up for lost time. Uh, I started with rentals, and but also I just once the floodgates opened, my parents had a little more money. I mean, I didn't get showered in games, but I picked them. So I started with Ultima Three for the NES, the terrible FCI port by Pony Canyon of that game. Pony Canyon, T yeah, Pony Canyon. That version of Ultima is almost unplayable, and I regret it to this day. Great soundtrack though uh, for the NES. So I, I went back to you know I'm going to play that on the Apple. Never mind. And then I went on to collect that classic library of extraordinary games. But I also, I had a real interest. I love the mainstream stuff. I read the Final Fantasy. Final Fantasy one has a remarkable place in my heart to this day. Dragon Quest, the very first Dragon Warrior. Oh man, I, I loved it. But I also played weird stuff like Swords and Serpents, the the party RPG with the use the four player adapter. Like, I didn't even know there was a four-player adapter for NES. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I there remember was, there was for Super Nintendo. There were two four-player adapters for the NES. Um, one was the NES Satellite, which used an IR sensor and didn't really work. And the other, the one I had, was the NES Foursquare, which was the same thing but wired. Hmm. And there were a number of uh, really good games made for it and a number of not-so-good games made for it. Um, I think it's probably best uses. Gauntlet 2 uh, was it was a good use for it. Um, the... Uh, Oh, Friday the 13th, or um, Nightmare on Elm Street was a terrible use for it. RC Pro-Am 2 
Four okay. players, really good. Huh. Uh, Swords and Serpents, not a great game, but really cool to play D&D with four friends, yeah. even though it didn't really matter to the game. There are actually quite a few things made for it. There's an entire issue of the Nintendo Power spinoff strategy guide series about the four-player games on the console. Wow. Yeah, okay. you read through it sometime. It's fun. Some sports games. and A Mule, that's what I really wanted, which was a PC game that I just loved. And Mule is, a great, to this day, one of the most innovative video games ever. I don't know if I've ever heard of it. So Mule is a game that you can play with a joystick and one button. It sounds like the most boring thing in the world. You and three friends all land on an alien planet. You have to survive, but you're also trying to prosper and beat the other guys. Hmm. If you screw up too bad, you all die. Like if any of you screws up too bad, you all die. Exactly. But at the end, one of you wants to win. Yeah. So like Four Swords Adventures. Kind of like that. Exactly. It's mostly about barter, but not like but very fast barter. There's an au- there's an auction system that's an action game. I don't know how to describe that. A very fun action game all about bluffing other people and it all takes place in a few seconds and it's about trying to commit to more but not overcommit mm. and screwing over your friends but teaming up temporarily and threatening to, dis- to burn the whole thing down if they're getting too far ahead of you and ruin it for everyone and it's all about diplomacy in the room on the couch elbowing your friend in the head because you're angry with them and betraying someone at just the right moment. I Into love it. games like that. It's kind of like DEF CON. If you ever played DEF CON, no. um, it's, it's delightful that way. That's, I wanted to play that on the NES. It was a computer game, but it worked with four player adapters. It's hard to get people to play it with you until they tried it. And they're like, cause it looks like the most boring, awful thing ever, yeah. man. It's great. Oh, what a great game. Um, Played a lot of Archon. I liked. I love the innovation of Archon. Again, a PC. I played a lot of PC ports to NES. Some of which were terrible, and some were wonderful. I liked some of the uh, some of the rare NES library. I thought Snake Rattle and Roll was beautiful, and I love the music on that. But again, Mega Man, Castlevania, all the things you expect me mm-hmm. to have liked, I loved. I was Zelda, deeply Mario, Zelda, Zelda. Zelda did hold. Zelda was an obsession. I create. I wrote quote unquote but i created pages and pages and pages of a tabletop rpg based on the legend of zelda as a kid where i drew all the items and stats and colored pencil and had check boxes for each of them so my friends could all have their unique character sheets and invented new things and and the playground thing where you'd sit around and talk with your friends and share strategy kind of stuff and make up things and the nintendo Wunkles, and that was all completely real and i realized if you weren't there for this this may sound like the most boring thing in the world i don't think it was better than what we have now What we have now is beautiful and amazing and incredible in its own way. I think people mistake that about me sometimes, that I somehow don't enjoy or play new games. Are you kidding? Blasphemy. This is a great age. What a year to play games. Oh, man. 2017. What a year to play. Yeah. Keeping it going. It's not that the old was better. It's that it was different, and I like variety. Mm -hmm. So I like reaching back to the past and touching that sometimes, and I like how it informs the present. It makes me wonder about what's possible in the future. That's me. So, Mar- uh, Mario 3? Yeah, well, you skipped over Mario 2. I mean, do, is there much to say there? Other than it's fantastic. Yeah. And m- so, as a kid, I remember being mind boggled by it. Um, now, you got to understand that our idea of sequels, at that point, was a little different than the idea of sequels we have now. I was used to sequels being the same thing with more. Um, Pac-Man to Miss Pac-Man. Fundamentally the same game, but a little better. Ultima 3 to Ultima 4. Fundamentally the same game, but with a big change. Wizardry to Wizardry 2, almost exactly the same game. Um, Then this weird thing happened in the Nintendo console generation... Where you had the NES 2s. So you want to explain the NES 2s, Tim? Because I feel like I've been doing all the I'm, Well, essentially, I mean, I'm sure most people know, but uh, during the NES generation, when you look at Mario, when you look at Zelda, when you look at Castlevania, uh, this the sequel to the game was drastically different than the first one. You, look, you compare Legend of Zelda to The Adventures of Link, and it is all of a sudden a 2D platformer sometimes, but then it also goes back to top down, but even then it's a different style of top down. Yeah, it's more a strategic map. It's a, exactly. It has an experience system suddenly. Yes, Most there's the, role-playing yeah. elements. Uh, then you look at, at, at uh, Castlevania, and it's just a very different style of game even. And oh, yeah, it's a completely different game. Yeah, going on. It's we- also not nearly as good, unfortunately, in Castlevania's case. I love Zelda 2. Zelda, Zelda, 2, Zelda, Zelda 2 is the only Zelda mainline game that I haven't beat. Really? It's just too hard. I love it. It's just way too difficult for me. One, well, okay, wait, one of the brightest moments of my childhood, oh my gosh, was getting to the end of Zelda 2 because that game is a, 
That game is a bear. Yeah, that was a rough game. It is. uh, It is the Dark Souls of Dark Souls. Um, No, it it is in fact a very difficult video Mm -hmm. game. Sometimes for obdurate reasons, but mostly for. I mean, that's that game is not getting enough credit. You have seven real fundamental move options through most of that game that you have from the very beginning. You know, you can stab, you can stab kneeling, you can jump and stab. There, there's a f- very few moves you can actually do. Then the upward and downward thrust, a couple other little things you can do. Block. Iconic. Yeah, you can block high, block low, stab high, stab low, jump, stab, upward thrust, downward thrust. Seven moves, really. And you have this in very, five of those seven from the beginning and two you get pretty soon. And almost every threat you meet in the game, you can overcome with a different combination of, of those moves. It's taking, it is a, it is a perfect, absolutely tremendous essay on how to take a very simple thing and iterate on it as far as it possibly can be and make it rewarding. When you die in Zelda two in combat, 90% of the time you're like, wow, I just lost to that guy. 10% Mm -hmm. of the time you're like, screw this. That was cheap. But 90% of the time I was out, I was out fought. Yeah. I was out uh, that I lost the sword fight. And I love that about it. And I don't think it's out of credit for that part of the game that 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 core mechanic is so finely tuned with the way you interact with each and every enemy in that game, which is really built around those core capabilities. Mm-hmm. Um, it does it better than most games. But yeah, getting to the end of Zelda 2, there's the Thunderbird, and I've you know, I've I've used my spell magic to to find and figure out how to hurt him. Because I've got the hint, and I'm like, okay, yeah, you spell, now he's vulnerable. But you got to go to that temple over and over and over and over just to get to the guy, and then you finally get to him, you can't hurt him. And I'm like, I beat this giant boss, which for an NES game, he was huge. And I'm like, the game is over. And I go outside, and like, it's really cool. There's like this kind of like dusk effect, and my shadow's right next to me. And I'm walking outside, and I'm like, this is such a cool effect. I've beaten the boss, there's the Triforce over there. And Not so fast, motherfucker. Blah, 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 blah. And my shadow leaps away from me, turns around and draws its sword and comes at me like that. Shadow Link was not a thing. Shadows coming and attacking you in video games were not a thing. That hadn't happened before. Two bosses at the end of a game was not a thing. That's not how it works. My, I remember just screaming in terror and being cut down instantly the first time that happened. And then loving it when I went back and beat the crap out of that yeah. jerk. I realize I kind of overtold that story, but. No, not at all. Yeah, I love moment, it. Yeah, no, I, I get you because, you know, we look back on that and even for me, like, like, like I said, I never beat Zelda 2, but I've, that moment still is iconic to me. Just even watching videos or seeing other people I know beat yeah. it and all that. And it's, that, that is such a crazy moment. When you don't know that's going to happen. People, you know, old games were simple. No, they, they were full of memorable moments. Um, that in Mario 2, you know, you get you get to the end of every level and you run into the little bird face. Mm-hmm. The first, remember right at the end when the bird when face the bird attacks, you? attacks you? That is one of the most. trade. Just like, what? Because you're not, again, it's, it's built on your expectations. Mario, like 2, in Mario, Mario 2 is so special to me. And I feel like it, it is totally underrated and does not get the love that it deserves. And maybe saying it's underrated is not fair because I feel like people do rate it highly. Uh, and yes, compared to the rest of the Mario series, it is not in the same caliber. Oh, I but disagree. I Really? No. I, I think that there's, I, I love the game so much, but I still, I still feel like uh, compared to Mario 3 and Mario World, it's not even in the same league. I think Doki Doki Panic Mario 2, and Mario 2 is a much better game than Doki Doki Panic. I've never played Doki Doki Panic. It's I ba- should. Mario 2 is like a polished Doki Doki Panic. It's mm. it's a much better game. It really is. Um, and again, I grew up with the All-Stars version. Of oh, all that's games. right. You're an All-Stars guy. Yeah, so, which I know is blasphemy to a lot of people. Well, the graphical jump from Mario mm-hmm. 1 to Mario 2 is, is mind-boggling as a kid because you didn't know what the machine was capable of. And also in those days... They could do things we can't really do now. You could put chips in a cartridge that made the NES more powerful. And they so you'd be like, wow, they sure are getting good at making games. Well, yes, they did get better at coding them. They really did over time. And they used amazing tricks to do things. The tricks that go into Mario are amazing. But they also put chips in the cartridge. They gave the Nintendo entirely new capabilities. Now you're playing with power. Yeah. And and so you would plug it in and like it would do things you'd never seen your machine do before. Punch Out does that. A lot of games do that. Mario 2, man, I think that jumping on top of everything mechanic 
is very well explored in the game. I think it's beautiful. I think the music's unreal. I think it's people say it's too short. I think it's a perfect length for oh, that game. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I that love it's too short or that it's the perfect length. The perfect length. Yeah. I love the the warp system in that game. Mm-hmm. I think it's brilliant. I think it really promotes uh, exploration, and I love the getting you know picking up the the different vegetables, but then sometimes you're getting the the potion and be like, oh, where's the right place to put it and being able to throw it down. And sometimes there's secret doors in the the other world. Yeah. Like, I loved that stuff so much. And uh, the bosses were so creative. The bad guys were creative. Being able to play as Peach, being able to play as Luigi. And, and they're Toad. all different. They all have different playing styles. Of course, you know, Team Peach till you die, even though it makes the game way too easy. But I don't care. Oh, no, I'm a Toad guy. On yeah. the, on, so, the okay. old Toad makes it hard. <laughs> That's back before Toad was horrible. Like that's back before Toad screamed <laughs> yeah. all the time. But Toad, I didn't think Toad was hard because Toad, he does have one strength. Do you, do you know? I mean, he doesn't he's jump the, all he's that the well. Fastest he's the fast picker up guy. And there are parts in the game that being able to pick up an enemy or a weapon or a vegetable is really advantageous, mm-hmm. actually, especially later in the game in some of the boss fights. That's huge because the princess, great float jump, slow picking stuff up. Very and in slow. boss fights, she's really vulnerable. Yeah. Toad, on the other hand, man, he just he's zips around. Zipping around, yeah. But the trade off is in the platforming. Peach has tiny little jump. Yeah. yeah, she's got that amazing like reach. Very similar though to the the big the bird at the end of the level and like that moment at first attacking you're like what is going on? Yeah. Uh, the I think they're called phantos. Yeah. When when you go down in in I think you first see them in the the desert world and you go down into one of the 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 weird pots not yeah. even a pipe boom, and boom, and you yes boom, and you're, you're, so you're you're in the, well that's Mario three. Oh wait no no the dun 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 dun. Pop. Boom, 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 yeah. boom, boom. No, that's Mario 2. That's Mario 3. That's underground in Mario 2. No, that's it's not. I'm telling you, it is. Oh, man. Oh, we're going to have fun here. Oh. That's dun, 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 dun. Boom, 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 I swear that's the desert map in Mario that's the, 3. That's the desert Mario 2. Oh, wait, we're going to have to. All right. Rather than try to solve this here. Yeah. I suggest you move on with your story. We're going we're gonna, we're gonna to move it on. Let us know. I, well, yeah, let us know in the comments. Um, I very well could be wrong, but I don't think that I have. There's a great theme, <laughs> desert theme, too, in, uh, it, that's very unique. But in Mario 3, the underground desert theme is... Oh, yeah. No, no, no. That's definitely the underground theme. Do, 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 do. It's just yeah. like the classic one with the drum. Right. Drum well, it's kit. a little it's different, but yeah, it's close. Uh, so, okay. But going back to it, uh, the Phantos, when you grab the key and the thing starts chasing you down, yeah. it's like, oh, shit, that's really cool. But then when you leave the pot <laughs> and it's still chasing it you comes from screen after to you. screen, God, that was so intense. And like that was the, the scariest thing experience I had in video games. I'll always talk about Resident Evil and how scared I was playing that Fatal Frame 2 all yep. Nothing scarier than the fucking Fanto thing chasing you down. That is so it, that is so prof- because you weren't used to games scaring you. And suddenly something's happening so uncanny, so unexpected. It's it's it gets at the core of of what makes this medium amazing. It's so people kept figuring out ways to make us feel new things. Mm-hmm. The guy who made Fanto is just sitting there going <laughs> and then you got to feel the fear. Yeah, man. I so, identify with that. So that's that's the the NES. Oh uh, wait, we got to do the Mario three story. Oh, of course. Okay, Sorry, go and for it's it. Quick. Give me the give me the Mario three. It's real short. When Mario three came out, um, we were talking about Half Life three confirmed. You know, earlier joking about that on another another show on Games Daily. M- Mario three. When you were there, the world of video games was not what it is now in terms of reach, but it was a big deal. And Mario, especially, was a big deal. Super Mario Brothers three. It is impossible to overemphasize if you were a kid in that world how big a deal that was. My, you didn't quite know when games were coming out. And so you would check at the stores and you would check at the rentals and you would check at the everywhere. And I had gotten the inside scoop on when my local video store was going to get it in. And they were going to get it in before other places they were telling us. But I'm at school one day, midday, and little boop, Jared Petty come to the office. So, you know, I was a good kid. I didn't get in trouble much. So I go to the office and my dad's there and he's like, hey, we got to go. It's like, everything all right? He's like, yes, yeah, fine. So my dad takes me out of the car and he drives me to the video store, which just opened. And there on the shelf are copies and copies and copies of Mario 3. And I grabbed the first one on the shelf there in my little corner of the world. And he's like, let's go home. And we got home. He's like, you want to hang out? I was like, no. He's like, I didn't think so. And I went upstairs <laughs> and I played Mario 3 during my school day till the sun went down and beyond. And it was one of those sublime days of my life. That is awesome. I love my dad. Yeah. What a baller ass <laughs> move. Oh my God. I have a couple of good gaming memories with my dad because again, I um 
my family never had a lot of money, but once we had a little more, we had the NES and then we got a, we actually got a PC, uh, an IBM PC. And then a, later on another kind of PC line thing, which meant that I got to start playing games like, uh, originally some of my earliest ones were like Maniac Mansion, mm. uh, which to this day is one of my all time favorite games. Mm. I like Maniac Mansion more than Day of the Tentacle, even though Day of the Tentacle is great because Maniac Mansion has multiple endings. You play with different characters, which means you have to solve all the puzzles different ways and leads to different ends. And it's a lot of fun. Uh, but I also ended up playing Civ. And Civ's another one of those games that was life changing. Mm -hmm. Um, the Civ games are, there's nothing quite like them. And, uh, my dad, that was one of the games. My dad didn't get hooked on mini games. He played the Atari with me some. He played Raiders of the Lost Ark, and we used to beat that together on the Atari, uh, which is a weird kind of early Zelda game. I like Raiders. Uh, mm -hmm. Another Howard Scott Warshaw game. And, but my dad didn't play NES. And he said there were too many buttons. And, which I think, yeah, I know, I love that. That is amazing. And so when we got to, uh, we got to PC, we played Civ, and... We were both hooked on it. It was all we would do. Just, and because we only had the one computer, we were constantly switching off. You know, it, it became like, hey, who's going to get Civ time? I remember it got to the point that I set my alarm for 3.30 in the morning, one school night, so I could wake up and play Civ until the sun came up and then pretend to go to bed just before. So I sneak downstairs after my alarms got off, jump out of bed at 3.30 in the morning, Sneak downstairs, and there's my dad at the computer playing Civ. That's awesome. And he's like, what are you doing here? And I was like, uh, uh, uh. He's like, come over here. So we sat down, and we played Civ together, just doing the, hey, let's go there. Let's do this thing, switching off our games back and forth until the sun came up side by side. And then my dad called into work, and he told me not to go to school. And we just sat there and played Civ until we were too exhausted to stay awake. And then we went to bed, and then we got to play more Civ. And that's another, I guess all my memories about playing video games and skipping school with my father. Yeah, I love this sticking stuff. with yeah. you. But so yeah, it was, I was very platform agnostic. Um, I didn't like the Genesis when it came out. So before before you get there, yeah, Cool Greg. I'm calling Cool Greg here. Cool Greg has to, has to come in here. You, you you geared up? You geared up? What's he got? Cool. cool Greg? We got the, this episode is brought to you by... Movement watches. So, you know, you guys have heard me talk about movement watches a lot. Cool Greg here, loving his movement watch. Look at that. Was it rose gold. Hell yeah. That's pretty cool. They have a whole bunch of different colors. You can get different uh, the watch faces, watch all that stuff. Um, and you, you love it, yours. Have you been late ever since you've gotten that watch? Never. Not once. Not once. Not once. Uh, movement's come far along from being crowdfunding kids working out of a living room. In the past year, they've not only introduced a ton of new watch collections for both men and women, but also expanded to sunglasses and fashion forward bracelets for her. So, hey, if you have a, a honey out there that you're trying to impress, movement watches, movement sunglasses, movement bracelets. Uh, movement watches started just $95 at a department store. You're looking at $400 to $500. Movement figured out that by selling online, they're able to cut out the middleman to get you the best possible price. Classic design, quality construction, and styled minimalism. You can get 15% off today with free shipping and free returns by going to mvmt.com slash kinda. So you can see why movement keeps growing and why we keep talking about it and why Cool Greg likes it so much. Uh, go to mvmt.com slash kinda. Join the movement. Thank you, Cool Greg. Hell yeah. There we Thank go. You. Tell you what, Tim. Yes. I, I'm almost embarrassed at this point by how egocentric I'm being on this cast. Uh, the headline of this video is Jared Petty's Gaming History. It'd be right, weird we'll go, if right. it wasn't about you. Well, thank you for putting um, up with this, friend. Although I do want Kevin to know that I do not have a stopwatch up. Uh, for some reason, Netflix started <laughs> on the screen, and it loaded a video, and it played it for a while, and then it went away. <laughs> Uh, and now it just says, yeah, oh, you're you're trial. So yeah, it does <laughs> I have no idea Netflix. how long we've been going. <laughs> yeah. um, but let's let's keep going here. So NES, you're talking about you're about to get to Genesis. Now, I don't want to skip a very important part of gaming history here. Mm -hmm. The Game Boy. Okay, so the Game Boy was my brother's. Now, mm -hmm. when the Game Boy was released, so you have a brother. So what's your family like look like here? Okay, so my brother is seven years younger than me, much younger than me, um, and. My parents were like, look, if we're getting you an NES, there's no freaking way we're buying you a Game Boy. Mm -hmm. We got another computer because you complained about there being no software there for the computer, and we want you to you know, do well in school, and computers have something to do with that in parents' minds at that point in totally, history. Totally, absolutely. Okay. Plus, my dad, honestly, he was working on some scholarly stuff and having a better word processor than he had. was Because early computers really in the home were used to write papers and print them, 
use the print shop and print out banners and signs for science fair projects and for like your church, play video games and do spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. And that's about, that's what 90% of people did with them in their homes. So to hijack this a little bit uh, to talk about me, because I love talking about me and, and kind of Kevin as well and, and our experience, like my uh, original memories playing video games where my dad had a Commodore 64 and uh, with a basket full of games. Oh, yeah. Uh, I vividly remember uh, James Pond. James Pond. Yeah, I absolutely. One of those games. Yeah. And then in addition to James Pond, there was a James Bond game called Diamonds Are Forever. On and the C64. On Commodore 64. I played that one. And that that to me was like the coolest thing possible. Like the, the first level, there was a plane and you jump out of the plane and you need to land on this like, there's like a raft on water and you need mm -hmm. to time it right. I don't think I ever did it correctly once in my life, but it felt like an action movie like that I got to play. So that was awesome. And uh, the game, my favorite Commodore 64 game that like really turned me on to video games was a game called Jumpman. Oh yeah, Jumpman's a fantastic game. And I love Jumpman. I, I loved it so much and I was so confused growing up uh, when I found out that Mario was called Jumpman and I was like, wait, are they the same Jumpman? Like what's going on? Yeah. What? I have a question for you. Yeah. What the fuck was Jumpman? And was that a like trying to, you know, take Mario's Jumpman was not directly related to Mario. Now, there was a period of time. You got to remember again, this is going to seem strange, but once upon a time, video game characters didn't jump over things. Uh, really until around the Donkey Kong era, you didn't have a lot of jumping over things. There are a few earlier examples, but not many. Mm hmm. And, and so what you have is this kind of game where people are like, whoa, you can make ladders and platforms between the ladders and you can jump over holes in those or over obstacles and climb ladders. And do that led to an entire world of iteration on that idea. Space Panic uh, is one of the earliest versions of that, which is a game that's kind of like that, but you can't jump. Mm. Then comes Donkey Kong, Load Runner, which came a little later. Still, the I, had load, I think we had Load Runner as well. Did you have an NES or did you have it on your computer? Uh, C64? Commodore, 64. Yeah, Load Runner for Commodore 64. C64, what a game, what a game platform. I mean, it, I, it just, I was didn't understand what a video game was. So oh to my. me, that was like, whoa. One of the all time great video game platforms, the C64. Hmm. Uh, I don't I, know that I can agree based on my experience. You had the wrong me. games. <laughs> uh, no, what, what a platform. Oh my gosh. And that sound, that sound chip. Oh, that sound chip's so good. Um, going back around. So Jumpman, Wizard, games like that. It's not like they were just ripping a game off. It wasn't a Donkey Kong clone. It was a thematic iteration on the idea of jumping around and climbing over things and what was possible. And there was a whole world of games, Kangaroo and, and, and things like that that came out around that time. Like, what can we climb? What can we jump over? What can we do with this next? Keystone Capers eventually introduces moving from screen to screen. Pitfall, Multi-tiered levels, yeah. jumping over barrels, leaping over pits, you know, or, or pits and and swinging over swamps and things like that. All of these and Jumpman fit into that world of what can we do with this? And they have mm -hmm. games like Wizard that takes a Jumpman kind of idea and it's like, well, yeah, I can do that. that plus zaps and superpowers. And then people put game construction kits in like, what can you come up with with this? Like Wizard, Ultimate Wizard came with its own. Uh, for the like season Mario four, like yeah, you know, its own Mario Maker. <laughs> that idea is really old. A lot of games used to come with those. Yeah, and and because you could save things on a disc, so why not? Wow. And people would be like, oh, the games are pretty simple. We'll just build a little construction kit into here. And so, no, it's not a blatant ripoff. I would I would say it's inspired by what might be the better way to think mm. about it. It's it's more like it's not even Bloodborne to Dark Souls. It's more like. Um, Crash Bandicoot to Mario. Yeah, more like that. I think that's yeah. closer. Okay. Yeah. And then the other game I just remember now, uh, the the best game that I like remember actually really liking because it was a good game, Centipede. Oh, I look okay, so I have a centipede, centipede in my on living room. Commodore sixty four. Yeah, I have a centipede in my living room. Uh like an arcade cabinet. Um awesome. what's that? Yeah, it's the it's a it's a cocktail uh, centipede. Oh, I bought cool. it from Sam Claiborne. It's fantastic. I love it very much. Actually, I use it for uh, uh, pockets full of quarter stuff uh, that I. Oh, done. cool. Yeah, and uh, probably will use it on hop, lip, and jump as well. But I love it. What a game! Why do you like it? Oh, I mean, I just loved it just because it was the out of the games that I named that I had on Commodore sixty four. It was the only one I could really wrap my head around the controls, and I I always felt like I knew what I was doing mm -hmm. uh, in it because I I must have been four. 
five playing this. Well, the nice thing about Centipede is shoot everything is generally the answer. Like yeah. everything is trying to kill you. Yeah. So kill so it just, all. Just keep shooting. Although actually in Centipede I've learned you control everything that's happening on the screen. Like when the fleas drop, what's everything but the where the spider's gonna show up, you control. And so if you get really, really good at Centipede, which I'm not yet, it's possible yet. to game that game so hard. It's amazing what you can huh. do with it. Yeah, that's uh, it's, very uh, cool. It's all determined by what you're doing with the mushrooms and the enemies that determines other things that happen. It's a really cool ecosystem. That game's really deep, and I had no idea before I got it. Hmm. Okay, so going back to you. Yeah. Game Boy, your brother has one. Yeah, so my bro the Game Boy becomes my brother's thing of it. I wanted the Game Boy. My friend, my next door neighbor had the Game Boy. I was like, oh, I love it so much. I want it. My parents are like, seriously, we got you an NES. We got you the computer. Now no. you turned into Mickey Mouse. It's For yeah, thing. turned into Mickey. Fortunately, brother comes along and brother gets the Game Boy. So that helps an awful lot. Tetris rocked my world. I think, I'm not trying to, paint myself as something I'm not. I'm, I'm a complete moron in so many ways. But when it comes to video games, I thought about them a lot. And I compared them a lot. And yes, I liked some bad games. But I Swimming do and think sevens. as a kid, I was pretty critical of games from very early on and compared them to each other and what was good and what was better. And I knew there was something special about Mario, not just from my love of the character, but because it was different than anything I'd seen. Mario 3, I was like, nobody's ever done things like this. I can fly. And I remember thinking, I would write things about it. You know, that was an early thing. Um, Tetris, I was like, there's never been anything like this. I was just like, this this is a new language of the way I played games. I didn't know that you could do this and it could be fun. And were you, so were you introduced to Tetris on Game Boy? Game Boy, yeah. Like, so like, you hadn't played the NES version? No, I hadn't played the NES version. I saw Tetris first on Game Boy. It was the, it was the pack-in and my, my neighbor got it. And I was like, and that sound of the game, I love the Game Boy speaker. Ding. Yeah, that but ding oh my the, there's like a Pav Pavlovian response. Like my mouth just watered when I hear that but when it rolls down. The Game Boy is a such an interesting beast. It's uh it's a Z eighty processor, like the the, the most sim okay, so I talked about the Trash eighty earlier. The Game Boy has the same processor in it that the Trash eighty did twelve years before. Um it's it was very easy to develop for because a lot of Japanese the programmers that did assembly had cut their teeth on Z eighty. Uh, because it was a popular format in Japan in the, in the late 70s, early 80s, which guaranteed these games were going to be have support almost immediately because a lot of Japanese programmers knew how to use it already. Well, more than that, like what's crazy to look at the the Game Boy might have had the the longest running lifespan of any quote unquote modern console. Looking back at, at what we think of like post NES, because Game Boy uh, came out in in what 80, 89. 89, and 89. then. Then it continued all the way through to, it wasn't until 98 that the Game Boy Color was introduced. Yeah. But even that was still playing the same games with uh, a couple exceptions of Game Boy Color exclusive Yeah, I think games. there's, I think that, yeah, there were quite a few Game Boy Color exclusive games, but I think there's a Harry Potter game for the original Game Boy in like 2001. I think that's the last one. I'm wow. not sure. Well, 2001's another... when uh, Game Boy Advance came out, so that, yeah, that I, would check out. I think so. Now, I might be confusing that with a Game Boy Color game, but I don't think so. I think, I think 2001's the last Game Boy game. I, again, that that could be a big fact check, though. I could be pulling that out of my butt. So that's a long... Yeah, it's but a even long, then, a lot of the Game Boy Color games weren't exclusive. They they were playable on Game Boy, but they had exclusive uh, color features, like Pokemon Gold and Silver, for example. So that's like the Atari 2600, which is 1977 to about 1990, had a, a viable lifespan. Damn. They were still making new 2600 games licensed in 90. Um, Neo Geo had a ridiculously long lifespan. I know that sounds weird, but they mm -hmm. made games for that thing forever. Uh, actually, in Japan, the PC Engine had a really long lifespan. What we call the TurboGrafx-16 mm. totally flopped here. In Japan, that thing had like more than a decade of life and an incredible library that we never got. Mm. That's my, that's my favorite like Japan chauvinism console. That wonderful look of those graphics, because it's an eight-bit processor and sixteen-bit graphics coprocessors, and it just has this kind of groovy flatness to it and the, the the color palette of it it looks like somebody drew a cartoon a lot of the time hmm. and in a different way than the genesis which has this kind of like like moldy arcadey very sega reds and browns and blues thing going on or the snes which is just like colors you know just so many colors the tg16 is just like 
ah, oh, this is like something I'd watch on Saturday morning. Hmm. I love it. I love the unique look of that thing. It's man, a lot of good games on that. I mean, the unique. It's so funny the different systems have that that look. Like looking at the jumping ahead to the N sixty four and PlayStation, uh, uh, and even Sega like Saturn. Yeah, like <gasps> you know, PlayStation was so dark. A lot of dark colors. Yeah, a lot of triangles. Yeah, a lot very of triangles. sharp. Everything's very sharp. Uh, the N sixty four, a lot of circles. Everything looks very smushed and blurry. Yeah, everything's you know? blurry. Let's, of, let's do some anti-aliasing here. Yeah, just a lot of blur. And then uh, the Saturn was kind of somewhere in between where it was a lot of sharp circles, uh, yeah. like a, like sharp um, spheres. Especially in the 3D. Well, the, the Saturn used quadratic polygons, like, like four-sided polys. Like the PlayStation uses three-sided polygons, triangles, which is what PCs also. That became the standard. But nobody's quite sure what the standard was going to be. And Sega bet wrong and went with four-sided polygons to make their 3D images, which meant anytime you wanted to make a Saturn game, you had to re effectively rewrite the 3D mm. because it didn't work the same way. The Saturn was doomed for about 20 different reasons. I love the Saturn. Also, you talk about that rounded 3D thing. Yes, in the 3D, but on the 2D, which is what the Saturn was originally built to do, 2D Saturn games are some of the most breathtakingly beautiful cartoon, bright color, sharp looking things you'll ever see. Nights into dreams. From 20th century. Well, that's a, that's a 3D that game. That is still, still kind that's of a, like a No, I'm talking about, no, let's, I'm talking about, let's, let's do some, let's do some um, Marvel superheroes fighting game. Or oh, let's, okay. Let's yeah. do, you know, let's do Alpha 3. Mm -hmm, let's do things mm -hmm. like that. Let's do Darksiders or, or not Darksiders, Darkstalkers, pardon me. Uh, let's do stuff like that. And and you get some just real, uh, Guardian Heroes, uh, which is, oh, what a beautiful game. But I do love some of the 3D on that with Radiant Silver Gun. By the way, you went back to the Game Boy yes. handhelds. I love them. I coveted them. I didn't have one for quite a while. Uh, that was also the era of the Lynx and the Game Gear, which were color. Oh, God. And the Game Gear, I don't know if there's three good games on the Game Gear. I've tried to identify them. <laughs> I am not going to crap on Sega. So, the Genesis I, has a superb library. As a kid, I didn't like some them. Some people like the I, Sonic uh, Game Gear games separately from the Sonic Genesis games. Those, people, they're different are, games. those people are wrong. <laughs> I actually have never, I mean, I've played them a little bit, but I, I've never extensively You know, You know what's it. really fun? A very pretty, technically brilliant, stunning Sonic game on a handheld. They're just like, how can this be happening on this hardware? What amounts to a master system with a smaller screen? Where no matter which direction you run, you immediately run into something you couldn't see. Mm. That's what playing Sonic on Game, Sonic Gear, on was Game like. Gear is like. Yeah, I, I I wish I could be kinder. The Master System versions of the same games are a little more playable because mm -hmm. you can see farther. What am I thinking of? Was it Triple Trouble? Was it Sonic? There was some Sonic game that I know people like. That Again, there are a few good Game Gear games. I'm being cruel. Um, I wanted one as a kid. I thought it was beautiful. I, what a beautiful... And and likewise, I thought the Master System was cool. There were a lot of good games on the Master System. I I to the I mean, Lord, you want to play Dragon's Trap on your uh, on your Switch? Remember that was originally a Master System game. Mm -hmm. You want to see what, that's a, if you haven't been playing Dragon's Trap, that's a delightful little game. You ever played it? No. Oh, okay. So it's on Switch right now. It's a great remake, but it also has a Master System mode you can cut into and play it in its original graphics. Wait, wait is it renamed now? It's is Wonder Boy Three Dragon's Wonder Trap. Wonder Boy Three. Okay, yeah, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, Dragon's Trap. But that was a and there's a lot. I'll talk about the Master System for two hours if you let me. I no, let's it. not do that. Okay, good. The <laughs> Genesis had a great library, but I but yeah, and even the Lynx before we knew it was going to fail, looked kind of cool. The problem with the Lynx is software. The hardware was great. Uh, Epix had built an amazing, amazing piece of hardware that Atari didn't really know what to do with when they forced Epix to, to turn it over to them. And Atari just couldn't, at that stage in its history, get its act together and, mm. and make that work. They were just too wounded and just lacked direction and mission at that point and all the stuff that was going on with Tremail's departure and it was just a mess so which is a whole other fascinating piece of video game history but back to video games Sega Saturn got so what, that. What, what I think we should do is uh, wrap this episode up <laughs> I'm so Le sorry. Le but like, we can keep talking for a little bit more. Uh, but leading into the, you know, uh, the 32-bit, 64-bit era. Yeah. So let's, let's everything pre-Saturn, pre-64, pre-PlayStation. Let's, let's, is there any, Get, any more there? Oh, there's a lot. Yeah. I mean, I barely touched on a lot of this stuff. I didn't, um, I have barely talked about arcades outside of seeing Mario, but Imagine what it was like at a time when video games were just better if you got up and went somebody someplace else to play them. Because right now, you know, arcades barely exist anywhere. 
And if you do go to one, the games aren't better. But at the time, with hardware costs happening on a very different different scope than they do now, and a very different economics than they do now, that's the word I was looking for, arcade games were objectively more capable mm. than what you could play at home. So if you wanted to play the best of certain kinds of games, you had to get up and get in your car and drive to the mall and play a game. And that created a world where social gaming, as we understand it, was a matter of people all showing up at a physical location. Putting a quarter on that put screen. Put a quarter on a screen. Say, I'm and next. Sh- exactly. I'm next. Sharing a common love. Oh my gosh, Street Fighter 2 and quartering up. I played Street Fighter 1 before Street Fighter 2. Um, and I, I was really lucky and privileged to have get this my extensive hands on this. knowledge. Exactly. Well, not knowledge, experience, just exposure. Experience, exactly. Yeah. And I still missed a lot mm-hmm. um, because you, nobody could play everything. Street Fighter 2, I arcades were kind of in trouble. I mean, brawlers were great and everybody loved playing X Men and TMNT and The Simpsons. But Street Fighter 2, which I actually first played at a Kroger uh, grocery store, that was just another one's like, well, this is special. There'd been fighting games before. I played some of them, but they weren't. Street Fighter II was silky smooth. I had two thoughts when I played, no, three thoughts when I played Street Fighter II. First, what is this guy with big spiky hair named Guile actually saying? When he's, is that, is that Sonic Boom? Is he really saying that? Second, this is the silky smoothest thing I've ever played. How is this so responsive? How is there so much here? Every stage has music. Why are there elephants? Oh my gosh, that man is electric and green. <laughs> mm, what is happening? Many questions. Why is Mike Tyson here? Now, uh, I have questions for you that you might yeah. be able to answer. Right. Ryu, what does he say? Because I clearly heard Sonic Boom for Guile. For Guile, but yeah. We well, have Hadouken. 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 We have yeah. Shoryuken. Shoryuken. Okay, which is Sho and then Ryu Ken. Ryu and yes, Ken. Yes, yes. Okay, they're there and together. And then when he jumps up and spins his legs around, it's a tornado oh, thing. Oh, I have no idea what he's saying at that Is moment. Is it Ansatsuken? I don't know what he's saying. Ansatsuken! I don't know. I'm not a Ryu guy. Yeah, man. It's, nobody knows. Yeah. You no, I mean, I, I have no idea what he's actually saying <laughs> okay. there. I um, I mean, some of the stuff... Who you are know, you? Who, what guy are you? Uh, I started as a Guile guy, but I quickly became a Chun-Li guy. I'm a Chun-Li guy. No, you're kidding. I'm I didn't know Chun-Li that. Guy. Not good. Oh, me neither. But Chun-Li's my girl. For no, sure. I tend to play girls in video games. When I have the I think opportunity, I do too, as well. I mean, going back to Princess Peach, I think it all started there yeah. in Mario Two. For me, I played Peach a lot in Mario Two, and also, have you ever played the Guardian Legend? Mm-mm. One of my the old- Guardian Legend might be the least provocative video game name of all time. <laughs> Gaudia Gaiden, uh, the Guardian Legend. <laughs> Uh, created by Compile, who made some of the very best NES, SNES, and PC games of the period. Um, an incredible developer responsible for a number of delightful games you've probably played and not realized they developed. Um, but Guardian Legend is, if The Legend of Zelda and the world's best shmup had a baby, where you switched between superbly designed shmup stages and then your plane transformed into a girl and she, a cyborg woman, walked around a Zelda-like world that was beautiful with incredible music. And then you jumped back into the shmup stages and the graphics were the best you'd ever seen on the NES. And the music was your favorite on the entire console. And you could continue and your arsenal of weapons just built and built and built. And you can come back to it with passwords. That's Guardian Legend, one of the best video games I've ever played. Hmm. Uh, I love it. I, I don't think it's a sleeper, really. It's, it, the word's gotten out. But its protagonist was a female. And as a kid, I was just like, she's like Ripley. Yeah. She's awesome. She's a girl that turns into a plane. Fuck yeah. And I was like, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I really love that. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I, because Ripley was just the coolest human being I could imagine at that point, mm-hmm. uh, being, a, being a kid of that age. You know, xenomorphs were awesome. They like eat people's faces and stuff. Yeah. And, and so she burned them with flamethrowers. Arcades, handhelds, which I barely scraped the surface of, but handhelds have become, we'll get into that in the next story, handhelds are where I live. Handhelds are my favorite way to play games. Uh, and so the Game Boy holds a tremendously important place in my heart that developed later on, weirdly, mm. when I kind of went back to it. Although I played a lot then when I could sneak it. Final Fantasy Legend, Final Fantasy Adventure. 
I feel like I'm leaving all these best friends behind. We haven't even talked about the SNES, which is just one of the, you know. Well, but, that, that will be there too. Yeah. And that then, Genesis proper. And we barely talked about it here, but the PC, which for me in this period, man, this is the era of Wolfenstein and Doom and Civilization and Master of Orion and some of the most marvelous video games ever created by human beings and all the great adventure games and the point and clicks. I really liked video games a little too much. And I love it. Jared, we're going to have to cut you off there. <laughs> All right. I think it's a good we'll go for, uh, Let us know in the comments like how you want us to continue this. I'm not I'm not sure when because we we're going back to regularly yeah. scheduled games. Sorry cast, about that, guys. Uh, for at least the foreseeable future. But at some point, we will definitely pick, pick this back up. But my thing is, I think it's endlessly interesting. Well, to, I'm a little worried that... To hear about little, this. I'm worried that listening to me talk about myself for an hour and a it's half... It's not talking about little, yourself, though. It's talk, It's like, it's. I thought I knew things, and then talking to you about so, so much stuff, I'm like, wow, Like you just have such perspective and an, knowledge. A, a knowledge and an actual, real, tangible understanding. I know some <laughs> things, but let's remember this, though. You know, Yes, it's exciting, but I've never had your experience and I've never had your beautiful childhood and your adulthood and you have, and think about the people right now out there listening, every one of them that chooses to be in a place like kind of funny, I'm going to guess each and every man and woman out there has their own gaming history story that is unique and beautiful and full of knowledge and has things they could teach us. And I want to hear those stories. I Me love too. them. Me too. Well, Jared, thank you very much for joining us for, for your first of very many Games cast. Uh, and until next week, I love you. Doki doki. Doki doki. I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, click here to subscribe to Kind of Funny Games. Click there to support us on Patreon. Click here to, uh, you know, let's see, I don't know. Subscribe to just Kind of Funny, just the normal channel. And click here uh, to watch some ice dancing videos. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs>